Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 170. I'm Bob DeMarco, and today we are talking to Jason Knight, uh, ABS Master Smith, Jason Knight, someone I've been trying to speak to for a while. I'm so excited to have him on the show. Uh, he first came on my radar when he was a substitute judge on Forged and Fire, but ever since uh, that, I started following him on Instagram and his brand of uh, Kukri slash Bowie has just had me hooked ever since. And I love looking at his work. And um, incidentally, he also has uh, has a uh, hosts weekends where you can come and learn his craft from him in his forge. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to have him on the show tonight. Uh, before we get there, if you value what we do here on the Knife Junkie podcast, please um, go check out our Patreon page and uh, you can sign up at a number of different levels and support us here. It's greatly appreciated if you do. Um, so without further delay, I would like to bring you Jason Knight. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Jason Knight, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Actually, okay, so that's a good icebreaker. You pulled a little shiv on me, uh, which I've been uh, seeing on your on your uh, Instagram page. Let, let's jump right in. What is that little honey? This is uh, called the Voodoo, and I based this on a knife concept from the OSS during World War II. There was the Office of Strategic Services or Office of Special Services, um, but they basically told the French farmers to take one of their hay rake tines, cut it off, and wrap it with leather and uh, kill a Nazi and get his gun or something, you know, the resistance. All right. So, so hold that up to your – hold that close to your camera. I have to see that. Mm, that is beautiful. Okay, so to me, it, it's like a uh, – it's, like uh, it's like a pocket gununting. Yeah. Oh. That is a it is, and it's sharpened on the inside like a gununting would be sharpened too. But only reason we sharpened it on one side instead of both, and on the inside instead of the out, is they are made in Italy, and there's some kind of importation laws about sharpened things or exportation laws there about sharpened things. So I decided to have it on the inside because I've used a lot of knives that are like, you know, they are they're recurved or they're inside curved, and they work really good like a claw or a beak or you know mm -hmm. it's something natural like you'd find outside but i've been using this knife for a while this is one of the prototypes it's just super handy to poke something or you know like this oh yeah yeah mix a drink maybe maybe uh you could access something inside a clamshell package well with that or, yeah. or, or, you know, you know, perhaps you could you get into the center of a, of a, of a beehive and get some honey, but that is a, that's a beautiful little knife. I, I yeah. love that. That's way up my alley. And, and if I had that, I would put that between my Elvia. It's a sort of Pical style knife and, uh, and my little double-edged tops dagger. So cool. I love that. So Jason Knight. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, well, you came onto my radar first from Forge and Fire, and we'll talk about that later. But I really, uh, really fell in love with your style of the style of knife you make. Um, it's recurve heavy, it's clip point heavy, it's kukri inspired, and with these beautiful ergonomic handles that that harken to me back to a sort of Filipino thing. I don't think that's your influence necessarily, but uh, tell me how you got involved in forging knives and how you got to where you are right now? Oh, well, about four or 5,000 years ago <laughs> when I was a little Latino, <laughs> I just always loved knives. And I grew up in literally a primeval swamp. So <laughs> uh, people think, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that the swamp that I grew up in near Charleston, a little place called Harleyville, they never cut those trees. So the deeper we get in the swamp, 
the water is moving. It's beautiful. And there's these 1,500, 1,600 year old trees in there. And I was always uh, bringing like a hatchet or a knife or maybe even a machete. Me and my cousin Andy and Brooke and David, they lived out there in it. They had a farm back there. And um, so I was always trying to like find the right tool and none of it really worked. So I was fascinated with the concept of forging and I'm trying to think how old I was when I saw Conan the Barbarian. I was, <laughs> might have been nine. Really, my dad was like, "Oh, it's fine for kids. We'll take them." <laughs> no big deal. And I was like, "You know, so that movie ruined my whole life." Besides yeah. that, and Star Wars, but you know, they're forging a sword, and I mean, I, you know, that's not how you forge a sword. But yeah, they're they're actually pouring it into a mold. But whatever, it's great. whatever. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> it gets a pass completely <laughs> yeah. because it was so cool. But that was the thing that made me just go, I got to figure out how you do this. And then the first, uh, I was the first blade smith that I ever met was probably Daniel Winkler. But the first blade smith I saw and was like writing articles about was Steve Schwarz, or he was working on some uh, woot steel with Al Pindre, and they would throw up a silk scarf. And Steve <laughs> cut it in half. You know, it was a magazine article. It was before the interweb and all that stuff and then um daniel winkler and karen shook karen winkler i met them when i was probably 15 or 16 i've been friends with them ever since and then i began serious taking forging blades and making knives very seriously in 2001 although i'd been making them since the 80s like 1986 87 to be more precise forging them from then yeah, yeah, forging since 2001. I'd been doing uh, just cutting them out and grinding them, whether it was a saw blade, I was cutting it out with a torch or or just mild steel or hammering. I did hammer some copper knives, but I spent a lot of time in fields looking for arrowheads too, you know. Those are one of my favorite things. So uh, I think we're maybe vaguely the same age, same generation. Uh, I grew up in the 70s and 80s uh, that, you know, my childhood. And and to me, you know, I talk a lot on the show about how when I was a kid, like your whole image of a man, like it included a Bowie knife on, on the belt or, or some kind of sheath knife, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if you wanted to approximate a man. And, uh, you know, that still sticks to today. Not that I walk around with Bowie knives, but, I, you know, I always have a couple on me. Um, it, you know, when I was reading your bio on your webpage, you talk about backyard adventures, costumes your mother made, and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' uh, books that your father read you. What, what was that? Uh, what was that whole imagination about what was happening? Oh, he, uh, it's kind of funny because he would read me John Carter of Mars and Tarzan. <laughs> And um, it's kind of weird because he is uh, his the rice part of his family was a part of my mom's side of the family going back to be like the great, 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 great uncle, which is kind of weird. She she discovered this a few years ago. And um, but I just love the stories. You know, I love I love to hear them. I love the adventure. You know, it was always it was like out of the frying pan into the fire, mm -hmm. deeper, deeper, deeper trouble. And it's kind of weird in his era. Uh, he was the era of Steinbeck and Hemingway. He actually outsold them because he was a Pulp Fiction writer and he outwrote them and outsold them. It's kind of crazy, but I love the stories. I love the idea of the, just the, the adventure of it uh, always with nothing. It's just like, uh, well, we prepared, but we lost everything. And it was, it was total like a regular adventure would go except for, um, you don't always win. It's like one of the cool things in the story is like he always got his ass out of the bind some kind of way, you know. But I mean, how can he kill out the main character, right? Right, right. Through his wits, and probably a knife had something to do with it. Uh, that's that's just me. I mean, my wife and I have this thing, like a running tally, uh, where in movies, uh, a folding knife or a small knife or just a knife uh, saves the day. It happens all the time. And if you start <laughs> making a tally, I, I got it. I got yeah. Um, so, uh, 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 you were taught, so James Fenimore Cooper, you know, like all the, like the last, the Mohicans and all of those old, uh, the oh, illustrations yeah. from those books, they all had the Bowie knives that, that, uh, that always had a big impression on me. So, okay. So you decide to start making knives at first it's stock removal. You're cutting things out of, uh, out of, um, 
out of saw blades or what have you and grinding them down. And then at some point you decide to take the jump to forging. What led to that? You know, why did you want to do forging? And then how did you actually forge ahead with it? Well, um, so when I was in high school, I was going over, there was a knife maker, very famous uh, in Walterboro, South Carolina. And I'm not going to say his name because it doesn't really matter. Uh, people who are, are cool with you giving their information say, hey, this guy helped mm -hmm. me out. Then I'm always cool to promote them. But I did it one time and he didn't like me referencing him. So I don't do it anymore. But he was a great and he still is a great blade maker, you know, knife maker. Um, I mean, some of the most stunning hollow grinds you've ever seen. Crazy curves, mm -hmm. big knives, recurves and stuff. And so I would go over there and watch him. uh make knives and grind and I'd cut out blades for him and drill the holes and stuff. And during that time, my dad was like, a he loved to play pool. So he won enough money in a pool game. I think it was 600, 700 bucks back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. He bought me a Bader grinder, like a BM two, which everything nice. was on certain, you know, it was all rounded off then. So it was really tricky. And I would do hollow ground stock removal knives, or I'd try to anyway, but the guy was a very discouraging type of a teacher. So everything was like, oh, that's crap. Oh, that's <laughs> crap. And it was just always garbage. And then in about 2006 or seven, there was a, a friend of mine. He was making some knives. And uh, I had been, I would save my money and I would buy a knife from George Heron every year. And I kind of put it out of my mind to make knives. I just felt like, what's the point? But then I, I got back into doing grinding, and I was basically doing kind of a George Heron style because George Herring was, he, Heron, he was cool, and he was encouraging. He was like, well, lad, and if everybody knew him, you know, they knew he'd say, well, lad. But he's like, you got to make this your own way, and this might not be your way. You know, you might you have to find another way to make it. This might not be the way that you're supposed to make knives. There's – you know, there's forging and there's other different ways. And I knew Daniel and Karen and Daniel was a bladesmith and he was a master smith and he was pretty doggone famous. You know what I mean? And they were friends of mine. So Daniel forged and he had his way. And I was like, man, I'm going to do it. Steve Schwarzer forged, Don Fogg forged. I was like, I'm going to learn how to do it. So I was working. Uh, I guess you could skip a little bit. I was working at a, a tire store. It's called Gerald's Tires and Brakes. One of the greatest jobs I ever had. But it was hard. And it was a lot of work. And we would be changing tires one day. It was, I think it was rainy and cold. And I was wearing shorts. That was our style. You know, we were all trying to out guy each other back in those days. <laughs> a lot of macho. And um, so my grandma was like, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to keep doing this? I was like, no, I really want to make knives. I want to learn how to forge. And so February 2001, I... Uh, my grandma basically was like, I will cover your butt until you can make this work. Mm. And I was just like, okay, I'm doing it. You know, and so that's what I tell people now. I was like, don't try to make knives for a living. <laughs> just go make them and have fun. But like, if you've got something else to do, keep doing it and make knives or do it because you love it or do it because it's your art. But don't have your mind to go, yeah. I'm going to make knives and sell them and make a living. God. Well, I didn't want to go back and do that anymore. I only wanted to make knives. And so I went to the school. I met a guy named Jim Rodabaugh. Our teacher was Jay Hendrickson. And Jay is cool. Um, you know, he's very famous for making that, that Bill Moran style and his style of it. And he basically just lit the fires for us and said, okay, go forge. I'm like, okay. So we were forging and I would draw stuff and I would forge that shape. And Rodabaugh was... Uh, making really smooth and I was like man how are you making it so smooth so I would I don't know I was just thinking about it like clay so it was kind of easy for me mm -hmm. and then he showed me how to make them smooth and we got to be friends and I just went back home I took I don't know how many knives that for is a lot and I took about the first 10 I made and uh, I went I had a bunch of friends at church and they were like oh I'll buy a knife you know so I was selling them for 150 200 bucks whatever I could get and I went on and i went to the blade show in atlanta <laughs> met a lot of people sold all my knives went to blade show west won an award sold all my knives and i just kept doing it and i 
I began to develop a style really early on because of kukris and Filipino knives and barongs. And okay. you're right about the Filipino knife thing. Because ah. I had a style, I had a way I wanted to make these things. And I was just kind of, I was like, this ain't it. And, I, and then I started putting the curves in the handle. And I liked, uh, my dad had a 57 Chevy when I was a kid. And I liked those fish hooks, those Maori style, you know, South Pacific Island, all that style. I like those curves. And I just started putting them into the knife and making it usable and workable. So this is pre Master Smith days, though, right? You're talking. Oh, right yeah. Now. Okay. Yeah. So now, so your style now is you're you're fully into the kukri. Are you making large? Oh, I, I, uh, I'm putting words into your mouth. Are you fully into the, into your kukri style? Are you making these large? Uh, uh, you, you mentioned that that you were starting to to be influenced by the Filipino handles and that kind of thing. So. What is the style of knife you're making at this time when you're going to all these shows and, and you're selling out? What are people buying them for and, and how are they being used? So early on, I was making more of a um, – I a couple of my focuses were because I was going for my journeyman, ultimately Mastersmith rating, and there are parameters, okay? So I was – my goal was to make my style, but I had to do – very clean finishes and very tight guard fits. And you know, so I slowly began to, you know, I'd make what I would call my Picasso knife. I'd be like, boom, there it is. And it'd be like, oh, everybody like, dang, that's so cool, you know. But then I would be like, okay, let me make this lame finish, 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 you know, fit, fit, fit. It was a lot more finishing and fitting at the, back then. And that was good. It's a good thing to learn. But it, it's just it bores me, you know. It's very yeah. But, but without me, that, you, know? you can't you can't command the money, can you? I mean, without fit and finish, no one's well, going to buy your knives. Well, if you don't learn it, no one's going to buy. You have to you have to pay your dues. Simple. Um, and I can do whatever I want to because I paid my dues. I've I've come up with my own style, my own design, and lent it generously to anyone who wanted to use it. I don't I don't complain about it one bit uh the sabrals the you know claudio sabral and his whole family they were making argentinian style knives and very cool you know and they were good talented people and he was like hey what about this one you made what's this i was like just make anything that i do you just do it okay okay <laughs> and they, they got my knife on the cover of blade magazine before i got my knife on the cover uh -huh. of blade magazine but i loved it because good for them you know Good well, for them, well he, good for he, me. So it's perfect. He, here's my point with the fit and finish stuff. I, I'm sorry to belabor this, but you mentioned Picasso before, and before Picasso could make his Cubist paintings and blow the world's mind, he had to prove to everyone that he could paint you, you know, in a photographic sense, in a in a you know purely formal sense, That's and right. so like proving that you have those fit and finish chops is is almost your your entree to be able to do what you want to do as a knife maker, I would imagine. Yeah. It's like uh, your own school that you're working in to master the basics so that you can do what you want. And I understood that because I am an art student. I did sculpture before I made mm -hmm. knives and that's something I guess I left out, but I would do carvings in wood and stone and, um, it just became an easy thing. Like I could get a picture of you, your face and your profile, and I could carve you in wood or stone. It was yeah. super easy. Uh, but I was translating the concepts because there was a lot of rules, you know, like when I was like, oh, they'd be like, oh, you got to do this. And the guard's got to fit like this. And it's got to be this. And I was like, okay, okay. So I would do that. You know, I'd make them all like I was trying to make it perfect. Yeah. And, I, and that's what I want. I wanted a perfect finish. I wanted a perfect fit. I wanted to the design to flow and be perfect. And I made some knives that had plate guards, you know, the, their standard, I guess maybe I call it the ABS style. I don't know what you call it, American Blacemith style, but mm -hmm. you know, cowboy kind of style Bowie knives. Okay. But nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. but it wasn't what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to incorporate the things I learned from the stock removal knives, like the, the sculpted in guards and the, you know, just a little more flow and a little more function, getting rid of those big Ricasso areas. I always hated those. I was finding like those are like choil. Like, How do you feel about choil? choil? Yeah. You don't yeah. like a choil. I don't. It's, it's. Has no place on your knives. That's for sure. Like you can do I, this and not get cut. <laughs> if I do that, 
I'm going to get cut. All right, all right, okay. So, so we're going to be all over the place. You you keep holding up the MK Ultra. That's your folder. It's a collaboration uh, design with Doug Markaida, uh, produced by Fox Knives, and it's it's. Uh, I'm just coming out of No New Knives November, and this is top one of one of the top five on my list, and uh, it has been for a while. Um, tell me, tell me what it's like translating your very. Uh, um, signature robust fixed blade kukri and and i throw bowie in because i always see a little bowie influence yeah. uh, uh uh how did that style translate into a folding mechanical uh context good question um so we made a i was working with doug and we had a lot of just sit around do nothing time so i would draw and Doug's like, hey, I got this crazy idea. We could do this and we could make a <laughs> – me and you could have like a collaboration where you make the knife, you design the knife, and then I would take it and use it. I'm like, okay. So we did first was a big kukri, which based on the the Queen's Regiment kukri, which is a lot smaller than the kukri I normally make. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, we could do this and then train – the Gurkhas were being trained in some kind of weird Taekwondo style and – Doug's idea was that we would train them in a Kali martial arts style, which is more simple and direct. So I was like, okay, we'll make this little this smaller kukri. So it was cool. So I made that. And he goes, oh, you know, it'd be cool if you made like a smaller, like a, a field size one. So I made that one, which originally was a half inch smaller than this. This is, this is the improved version, which never went into production with me and Doug. This is the V2. So right. all and, that, and that is fresh out. Yeah. That's fresh out on the scene right now, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That and then the folder was just based on that. And I'm not. Um, and I had help with the mechanics on the inside. Mm -hmm. So I was like, "This is what it will look like." I know that I'd made a paper a, in a plastic version, so I knew it would fit in the handle. Mm -hmm. So I had someone work out the mechanics for me. So that was, you know. That, was that, good. that is so cool. I, I mean, I love that knife. That's about a four inch blade, right? Uh, yes, four inch blade. Okay, and that blade shape, every, everything about that, um, and and plus, it's an opportunity to get a Jason Knight knife, um, you know, at a at, at an affordable price. I know it's a Fox made knife, but it's your design, and there, uh, yeah. So th yeah, they don't sell them. Um, we buy them from them. Okay, we so yeah. them to make them, and then they're through tacticalelements.com. Okay, that's what I was going to say. So if I wanted to buy, well, which I do uh, tomorrow, because tomorrow is December first, as we're recording this, uh, <clears throat> uh, no new knife November will be over, and I plan to buy a couple of tactical <laughs> knives. <laughs> and uh, uh, so if I were to go to tactical elements, is that the only place you can find that knife? Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. So. Definitely, definitely check that. Out. Okay, yeah. so I want to. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm bouncing around here, but I want to get back oh. to some of your training. Okay, so uh, in 2001, you end up going and and studying at Bill Moran's School of Bladesmithing. Now, Bill Moran, to me, uh, uh, he's he's a classic. Well, not a classic. He's a uh, he's one of those knife makers that's up there with Bob Loveless, and uh, you know he he's got some signature styles that that have echoed. Uh, you know, through the generations after him. Uh, tell me about your your experience going there. And that was in Arkansas, the land of the Bowie knife. Like, what was that like <laughs> going to Arkansas to learn how to how to forge at Bill Moran Studio? Uh, it was a it was a fun adventure. You know, I I had an old Toyota pickup truck, and uh, I remember I brought my bicycle. I don't think I I didn't bring any. I didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't really have any tools to bring. I did bring a I had a Sears Craftsman. Uh, the blacksmith's hammer, which was a cross peen hammer. I brought that. And the it's kind of funny because <laughs> the first person I met was Jim Rodebo. And I, I was like, I'm not going to like this guy right off the kick. <laughs> he, was around, he was going around with the teacher, and I knew who Jay was. You know, Jay was a very famous bladesmith. And he was like, okay, Jay, whatever I can do to help you, da 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 And J Jim had been forging blades under a guy named Al Barton for several years who Al Barton was a master bladesmith from California. So he already knew how to make knives and he was good at it. 
And uh, I knew how to grind knives, but I didn't really understand really the dynamic of heat treating. So, like I said, Jay basically just like, okay, fellas, here's how you do a fire and let me forge a Bowie knife and that's it. Okay, go at it. And he let us go <laughs> at it. <laughs> I was like, how's this looking? He goes, yep, you're doing great. And we just kept smashing steel. You know, I think I made 40 knives at that time, but me and Rodeball hit it off good. And there was all these crazy characters in that class. There was one guy, we called him Whispering Pete. <laughs> and um, there was a bunkhouse. I didn't stay in a bunkhouse because I – at the time, I was very sensitive to, um, like, the whole ghost thing. You know, like, I walked in the old monk house, and I was like, nope. It's full of it's full of spirits, and I don't want to be here. Like, I just knew it. I'm like, I ain't staying here. And it was. And everybody else that stayed there experienced it. So, I'm but, laughing at you, but yeah. it's not. It's I'm laughing next to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just sensitive to it. So, I remember wrote about talking about one night, Whispering Pete was walking around. It was in the dark. And he was standing over his bed. He's like, hey, Jim, you think this knife is sharp enough? And he's like, <laughs> I'm laying there sleeping. And the guy's standing over there over me with a knife. And I'm like, crazy stuff. But I had a great time, and I miss it. It was like, I want to go back and experience it again, but I'd have to figure out some kind of disguise <laughs> um, because everybody knows me, of course, you know, but like, I could do something. I could come up with something. I don't oh, know. yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Grow that beard back. Forehead, it gives it away all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in that club. I'm getting my power alleys, as my brother calls them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, let, me, so let me ask you this. Uh, you, you're talking about, okay, we're, we're, frequently I, I talk to people who work in different settings, not necessarily a forge. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going we're gonna to show off some of your work in a second. I'm just uh, having fun. Oh yeah. Uh, but, but okay. So a lot of people are really hung up on specs, how, how thinly something is ground to what dimension and, uh, you know, some knife people can get very particular in their tastes, what they like. How does that jibe like that, that level of like super particularness, um, which I'm not sure if, if that goes beyond just geekery or not, how does that jibe with forging, which seems to be a more elemental process? You know, you're in there like uh, hammering out hot metal and then you're taking it to the grinder and stuff. But, you know, it doesn't seem like so much. It, it seems less scientific, more uh, uh, emotional and instinctive. Yeah, I think you're kind of right. It's more it's very artsy. However, um, I i in mean, always in the process of making it more of, I don't like to use the word, you know, we've taken the word science and really screwed it up over the last <laughs> hundred years, what we call science. You know, it's like, and the funny thing is, I, I was listening to a guy talking today, said his physics book from the time when he was a young fellow going to college is completely different than the one there is now. And there was like, oh, science never changes. Yes, it does. It always changes uh, because you're not using the scientific principles or the scientific methods. So it, it's become, I, and I'm not trying to go off on a tangent, but it's just what I think about it. Bladesmithing and knife making is art. Specific knife design is more mechanical and technical. It is, you know, a certain knife is designed for a certain usage. Like if I see someone's hunting knife or skinning knife, uh, I can look at that knife and tell if they've ever skinned an animal before or they just did a really good job copying someone else's version or they listened to somebody like S.R. Johnson who skinned a lot of knives and they said, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll put that drop point concept into my lineup. I dropped a bomb there, but maybe it's just my opinion, right? Well, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, 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 I'm getting hung up. I'm getting hung up for a second, but, and I'm thinking, you know, we're both art school nerds, and I, and I, and I, and I feel us going down a, going, going down a rabbit hole. But like, yeah. uh, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, there, there is the, the design process, but there is also, like you're saying, the history, uh, the, the history and the practical functioning of something. Yeah. that that also goes into something uh that and and so the uh, you know the achieving the perfect uh 
utility in that design is is the ultimate design. And you said knife making is art. I I, I would have to differ with you and say that I think that it's design. I think that art only has the purpose or the or the uh, the function of being appreciated for itself, whereas a knife can be used for all these other things. Well, so, I agree with that too. What I mean more specifically is the process of doing it is an art. It's like a performing art in a lot of ways. And if it's not, I'm really trying to make it a performing art because it is a, a stress reliever. It is a depression fighter. It is all these different things when you're forging a blade. Now, just to be on the, you know, go back to your other question, um, technically, I make knives through many processes, and I always think it's interesting when I meet different people. So I make knives by forging. I make knives by grinding. I make knives with water jet and someone else grinding or myself or a burger grinder. I also make knives with three axis and five axis machines. So I've made knives and am making knives right now through every process available to me. And that's what's interesting, I find. Um, forging is just the part to get a, maybe it's to get a texture, maybe it's to get a style, maybe it's to get a certain thing I can't get by just reducing material. Uh, primarily now it's to get patterning in steel or a forged texture because all the steel that any of us are using as knife makers, uh, if you're not making the steel yourself, you know, if you're making the steel, of course, you're going to have to forge it. But if you're not making steel, stainless steel, for example, comes in a big ingot and it goes to the rolling mill. And that process of bringing it down to the size is called forging. I didn't invent it. It's just the truth. But that's the fun part. <laughs> so, OK, uh, you say that you make knives across the entire spectrum of how one can make knives in this modern age you know from 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 you forging to the most modern machine taking your design and executing it uh to you i mean to me it seems like all right let me just say what to me it seems like the forging part is the most spiritual aspect i i have uh you know i mentioned this a lot i have merely dabbled as 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 the most tourist of tourists in knife making in the in the 20 or so odd knives i've made over four years you know just uh in the time i have and i know that it takes a lot just to take a little piece of steel and to grind it into something that i would pay money for that's one dimension of spirituality but you go to the level of heating up steel and looking at the color of it and 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 going off of instinct on the color and your experience and knowing when to quench it and all that knowing how to pound it out into a shape to me that seems like a a, a spiritual the most spiritual maybe aspect of knife making uh how, how would you characterize it yeah i think it's a good way to process it um it's the most uh, satisfying if that makes sense you're taking you're taking raw material or, or refined, you know, uh, material that's not a knife and you are forming it into shape. And we say beating and bamming. Hammering sounds so coarse, but it's actually, there's a lot of precision involved in hammering something into shape. Have you ever played with a piece of clay? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So the steel moves exactly like the forming of the clay. Exactly. It, it moves the same way. No matter what you do, it will move in the same directions as the clay will move. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, you, whether you use a hand hammer or a power hammer or a press or rolling mill, the clay and the steel act the same. And understanding that dynamic, you're jumping over a mountain and you're getting on the other side of this plateau going, whoa, now I can forge like easy. And I show that to people. It is it is like that. It is uh it's deep inside. It's like it's like cutting the river channel, you know, for the new river cutting its way across the, the plains. I you know, I don't know how else to explain it. It's it's like a new growth of something, a new birth of something. So that's the fun part about it. And it can still fail at any moment along the way. 
and then going, I know what I want to forge. I'm not just forming a, you know, a lot of times people just make a pancake or a spoon shape, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I try and throw people right when they come and take a class with me. I throw you right into the machine. Okay, just use the machine. Just do it. No big deal. And I can tell that they're uncomfortable, but I help them. You know, I help them, and they're, they're there forging. I'm pushing their hands along, and they're doing it, and it's so easy, and they have fun with it, and they're done, and they're like, gosh, I made that. But I, that, it is a it is a relationship-forming, uh, confidence-building, yeah, spiritual process. It's cool. It's a hmm. cool thing. It's fun to do. And you talk about clay and everyone who's been a child, and that's everybody has experienced clay and they know you add too much pressure towards the uh, edge, it breaks up or whatever it is. Uh, that seems like uh, a great analogy to, to pass along to people. Okay, so you do classes, you teach people your art. How? Tell me about that. How does that work? Uh, people come from all over the world to my studio. Studio. I started calling it studio. Atelier, of perhaps. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I do. I've done a bunch of different kinds of classes: mosaic, Damascus, integral, chef's knife, all kind of crazy stuff. This year, twenty twenty one, I'm just going to do two, with one exception. So I teach you how to forge a knife or a tomahawk. And I teach you every process of it. We'll design it. We'll forge it, grind it, we'll heat treat it. Every every detail handles. It. And you walk. Well, you're doing ninety percent of it. I'm doing ten percent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's always fun to see what people make, and especially when they go, "Well, you did most of it," and I'm like, "No, that's your knife. That's my knife." <laughs> yeah. And they go, "Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Very different. Yeah, yours is way better. <laughs> that's mine, and that's yours." So, it's so wait, what's what's the difference between making a a tomahawk? Well, I'm, I know it's a huge difference, but between making a tomahawk and a knife, is there a huge uh, process difference? Well, yeah, it's an integral tomahawk, so it's a lot more forging. We basically take a two inch by two inch round and forge it into a T and then stretch the handle out to make a full oh. integral and make one side a spike and one side's the blade. And so it's some and then of the, the handle fun. goes all the way down and you, Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. But what I found was people could do it. It's like one of those classes I've taught and it was like people, it's more forging. And so every class that we do, that's more forging is always more fun and easier to translate what's difficult to translate is grinding like hey i'm going to do a dagger making glass and guess what no one's going to be able to grind a dagger so you know it's just it's hard it's really hard to, to understand that grinding one weird thing i found everyone who comes into class that can play a musical instrument and i don't mean uh -huh. once a year for 20 years experience i mean people who play all the time yeah they grind easy grinding is nothing for them feel they have feel they have feel so they can i was like can you play guitar and i go yeah i was like ah, you'll grind easy and they do every time i've never been wrong they always just Shh, no big deal they can play it so it's always fun that is cool so uh in terms of um like like the people who come to you is it is it all bladesmiths who want to up their game or is it people who are just uh, have a hot nut to try out something new like what yeah it's 90 percent people who just want to go do it and 10 percent maybe people who are making knives or want to make knives mm -hmm. uh, everybody uh, i try and present it in a way that's why i call it a maker's forge studio i don't say class school and teach like imagine how that sounds <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. i don't want to go to class and school and yeah, man. yeah. Don't teach me anything, do man. <laughs> but makers forge. So you step into my studio. You're the maker. It's yours. This you become part of the process. And I involved everyone as deep as I'm in it. You're right there in it, getting dirty, enjoying it. Um, you know, I I take people. I take them out locally. I'm kind of a local ambassador. I like to think of it because I live in a real beautiful place in East Tennessee. Oh, so there's nice. mountains everywhere. There's water everywhere. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. I ran out of whiskey. Um, <laughs> and 
I like to share the things that I like with them. You know, we have like a, this Asian fusion place called Stir Fry. If you've been here to my class, I've taken you to Stir Fry. You've been there. You know, it's a great place. It's a, the guy who owns it's usually in there. It's really cool. So I, I love that process. I love getting to know the people in the class. I love to form the relationships with them. I like to be, you know, you meet new friends. And then here's the other thing. I'm a, I'm a rogue in a lot of ways. But one way I am is I will steal your knife concept in a second. Hey, <laughs> a guy told me today, he's like, hey, have you ever thought about when you're mixing on that cardboard? The cardboard has wax. Have you ever had sometimes where it doesn't stick? And I was just like, oh, yeah. Yeah, never use cardboard to mix on. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> but I was like, I appreciate what he said because I realized, man, he's right. You know, that's that's right. That is that's an issue. That can be an issue. Uh, but uh, a curve, a line or something. Sometimes people will drop them in a the class. And I'm like, whoa, yes. Or they'll take something out. And I like that better almost, you know, taking something out. They're like, hey, have you ever thought about going from here to here instead of going like this? I'm like, ooh, I like going from here to here. That's cool. Yeah. So, well, it's it's that concept of teaching. Like you learn so much when you teach. Uh, because yeah. your your students come in it with a fresh or innocent eye and they can give you things that you hadn't thought of in years or or concepts that you don't you know that that uh, you know that hadn't uh, occurred to you so what what about you what do you carry what do you use knives for and and what like when you're making a knife what what are you thinking of and and how are you you know what do you where do you want it to go and do <laughs> so this is one of my EDCs. Ooh. That is... Uh, is that an integral? It's an integral made by Tiger Lily. Oh. So that's one of hers. But this is kind of one of my favorite size knives because I can carry it every day. I usually will carry them um, like horizontal on a belt. So mm -hmm. if I hop off the tractor or a motorcycle or something or if I'm... If I'm climbing up the hill or it's kind of a mountain, I don't, I, it won't stab me. It's, it's riding mm -hmm. in a good spot. You know, it's very comfortable. It's very handy. I mean, we weren't born with claws and fangs. Um, I, I am a bit of a savage, but I'm also civilized enough to use tools. Mm -hmm. So I always want to have a tool. I don't like opening stuff with my teeth. That's kind of stupid. Or your um, keys. Yeah. Tool. Yeah, so I like doing it, and I may as well do it in style with a nice knife. So I, I like that number one aspect. And so, again, growing up in that swamp, I like those big recurved choppers and bowie knives and kukris. Um, I'll tell you another thing where my knife making and Adam DeRozier's knife making kind of made a quantum. Adam DeRozier is a great friend of mine. He's a master bladesmith. His wife, Haley, is a master bladesmith. My daughter is currently up there with them in Alaska. But uh, me and Adam, uh, he was like a new knife maker. But he understood some concepts about uh, the physics of the knife, like uh, velocity and mass. Mm -hmm. Because we only had so much length of a blade that we want to carry. And it might need to be heavier for a certain size if we're going to chop with it. So Adam was making these really robust knives and I'd played with it a little bit, but I realized like a really heavy 10, 11 inch chopper is going to chop better than a, than a really thin light 10, 11 inch chopper. It's just not going to be able to get into stuff because you can't generate the velocity. So that was another fun thing thinking about it and then really inspecting old Quillian daggers, old Pesh Kabaz, all these old knives that were like if it's a stabby knife, if you look at the point, yeah. they're real pointy, but they're real reinforced. Or right, if it's right. a cutting knife, they're really, you know, they're either long and thin or they're like, in the case of like a barong, a barong is wide and thick and has tape taper in both directions. Just things that you don't pay attention to if you're focused on making the bowie knife with the plate guard and the, you know, kind of the broomstick handle. I'm not picking on it. It's just. That's a that's I don't believe the historical narrative of that knife, if that makes sense, because yeah. it has little to zero use. And I've used it was like this knife does not work as good as this knife. 
Why did this become popular? Wait, 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 wait. wait. How how does it have? You're, you're, you're talking about <laughs> you're talking about the uh, you're talking about the coffin handle shaped Bowie knife, right? Like, uh, and so you're saying that has zero, a little to zero use. <laughs> oh, please, please explain. Awesome. So the, a lot of the the old, my opinion, of course, all right, yeah. I'm not, this ain't the law or nothing, <laughs> but when you're looking at all these old English Bowie knives, they were building these knives based on a story about a land swindler named James Bowie and his brother Reason Bowie. And they didn't know what his knife looked like. Now his knife, I've seen, you know, some versions of his knife and I... I think it's actually kind of clever if you think about it. That buoy number one with that weird handle that kind of mm-hmm. lends itself to fencing and taking it and turning it over and making a stab or like it's kind of like a wakizashi in the way it's bent in the middle. Yep. So it's kind of clever as far as a weapon goes. That's not the knife I'm talking about. The knives I'm talking about are all the English buoy knives that were being sent over here by the maybe boatload. The Sheffield makers. Yeah, the Sheffield makers. From the from the 1820s through the 1850s and 60s, a lot of these knife designs were just kind of like uh, they look kind of like kitchen knives, right? I mean, you know what they were? A lot of those Sheffield Bowie knives looked like gentlemen's weapons. You know what I mean? Like something that you would have in your cummerbund or whatever in your in your in your belt, and you would only extract it, you know, in a gentlemanly you know fight. Like, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but they don't. So what is that dig, dag? Well, we'll get there in a second. Hold, hold that in your hand. Uh, but but so so to you that was that was not uh, that was not going to take you all the way there. So you had to do what with your designs? Uh, I wanted to understand the way the knife worked, and so when I was growing up, I had some friends. They had they were. Uh, my friend Robert brought these beautiful Filipino sisters over here, okay? And they had all these knives that they had collected. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily from where they were from, but they just he had all these cool knives. They had like a, a bolo and barong, and they had all these cool things. And we would chop with them, and, man, they worked good. And then I found a kukri in a toolbox when I was a kid, and uh, my, there were K-bars in there, too. And my cousin was like, oh, the K-bar, this is good. And I was like, oh, this thing is kind of cool. He's like, oh, it's ugly. That's a terrible knife. <laughs> And I liked the kukri because it would cut really like it would just cut. Whereas where you were cutting with the K bar, you were holding it and then ended up holding it with two fingers. Now it's not a bad knife. It's just not, you know, it's a knife intended to fulfill certain needs and, um, uh, and different, you know, kukris are intended to fill different needs. And I just was trying to take something based on my experience growing up in the woods playing in the swamp and said, what knife works the best for me clearing trails and bushwhacking and just going on adventures, you know, what works good. So I came up with a, like a recurve buoy knife with a big clip and I added stuff, to it, but I like that better. Yeah. And then when I was skinning, you know, skinning deer and stuff. Oh, here's one. <laughs> so this is a really old Adam DeRozier's knife, but this is a knife based on he and I was making, we kind of still are. We beautiful. We make a hunter that's like, you know, it's like this with a point. So you can, like, if you've ever field dressed an animal, you core their butt and right, get, right, right. Field dress them. I mean, that's just the way it goes. But if you put a gut hook on it, guess what? It's good for getting that pot off of your coffee off the campfire. <laughs> that's, that's all it's good for. It doesn't even make sense. But I'm not. I don't criticize knife makers who design and use knives or or here's a, a crazier one we think about the the old mono a mono knife fight of mm. the uh the buoy era right yes so i know some people and un- unfortunately they have terrible terrible jobs and um they've been in uh i don't know if you want to call them terrible situations situations where yeah. This is this is what they were using, and uh, the other people weren't in a knife fight with them. The other people were probably sleeping. Mm. So, yeah. just point in fact, it's like this is this is not intended for you to go. Okay, let's have a knife fight. Right. This is right. intended for me to save my buddies 
from all those bastards who are going to kill us, but I'm going to get them while they're sleeping. That's a terrible job. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to make. No, uh, no, no. It's, it's like Odysseus and Diomedes creeping across the battlefield in the Iliad. Uh, that's right. Uh, not, not to get high handed, but I love that scene. And that's exactly what, what that reminds me of. Um, that's what it is. It's so, so hold that, hold that knife up for a second. And, and as you do, uh, oh, that is beautiful. This is uh, my version of the Fairbairn dagger. Mm. And uh, I just made it more, it's the same length and it's the same dimensions. It's a little wider and mm -hmm. it's twice as thick. Yeah. So they were like eighth of an inch. This is a quarter inch. And I, I worked on this when I was at Winkler Knives. And uh, the, the idea was to put it in production. And I think they, you know, we had like 20 some of them, maybe 24, which they finished and sold. This is one of the prototypes. I've got one that's unmarked and I've got one that's marked with my mark and Daniel's mark. So this is kind of cool. But this was in particular one that was with a bunch of different knives we submitted to a certain group because they wanted an insulated handle. So I came up with this insulated handle that was not rubber. So they wanted a, a non-handle. I was going to. Uh, this one's Micarta and G10 and G10 pins. So funny thing is, is uh, no one had, I, I'm sure people have done it, but they wanted one that had uh, not rubber. So they found that no one had done it before. Not the, not this shape specifically, but the mm -hmm. concept. And so that their attorney got it patented. Oh, that was kind of cool. But they have rights. There's another one. That's the one I call the Wilderness. Winkler still makes this one, but this also has the insulated hand. This one's also unmarked. Mm -hmm. But but these were nice. We submitted all of them, and they were like, "Yeah, this is a great idea. We like it, and it you know it won't arc and uh, it won't transmit electricity." I don't understand electricity, so I just <laughs> know that. I, I knew that all that material was non you know conductive, so that's why I used it. But it was their benefit. And I like to make things for my friends. If they need a tool, I want to make a tool that they can use. So that's important to me. So on, on, a, on a day that you get to yourself, uh, what what is a day like in your forge when you're not teaching a class and you have it to yourself? And what is the knife you would ideally be making? Oh, I like to. I like making swords, <laughs> but they're hard to. They're hard to make. They're hard to finish. Uh, but I like to make swords. I'm real fascinated with swords that are from that. Um, I think it's kind of weird. We we call this we, that Egyptian, Persian, Greek, Roman kind mm -hmm. of a, Bronze you know, Age, Bronze Age stuff. Um, which, strangely enough, I'm pretty convinced that bronze is a superior material to steel, but that's my opinion, man. It's just really? like my opinion, man. Well, it doesn't rust. It doesn't really decompose. Um, it's can a you lot. It? Oh, yeah. You can make it hard enough to shave with. I mean, you can make – in fact, this is uh, – Actually, my doorknob is my, – my front door is uh, bronze. My yeah. front doorknob, yeah. Yeah. Um, Playing with bronze in my forge, I was making a blade one time, and I had a 28-ton press. In some kind of way, I just canted it in there wrong, and the bronze mashed the steel dies in half. As I closed it, the <laughs> um, the bronze pushed the steel. I had to make new dies. Oh, my so God. So it was just – it's you know, think about uh, what we make projectiles out of now. It's copper and lead or copper. Mm -hmm. So uh, bronze is that's a whole nother subject. So so why why did they move on? Just bronze uh too heavy and well what if it was too expensive? Ah. What if they figured out easier ways to work steel? What what if nobody living that you know or I know was there at that time to see what the hell actually happened? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, that's that's all we really have are a multitude of assumptions. And one of the things that I really just, I never bought into was 
Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, because stone tools have superior cutting edges. They can push cells apart. Um, it's but they break simple. easy. They're brittle. But everybody can make them. Come on, man. Join us in the 24th. Everyone can make them. Have you ever tried? Well, I'm sure you have. Na uh, flint napping? Yeah. That's no, that's no walk in the park. <laughs> break. I mean, break. just drop something. Break something. Go out in the woods and, you know, you find flint or something. You make a bifacially fractured edge and it cuts. That's so it's just available. You know, it's yeah, available. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's available and, and, and it is about the thinnest edge you can get, right? Yeah. It's just one of the, it's a thought. It's not, like I said, I, I like to think about these, explore these. It makes me a better knife maker. And I don't necessarily buy the narratives that are just, here's the, here it is. Here's the box. Mm -hmm. Look in the box. Just look in the box. And okay, now look mm -hmm. in this box. And I, I just never did it. I just couldn't do it. Because, and I think it helps me as a bladesmith, you know, like even this knife, you know, I understand the concept of this knife. Yeah. This, but I also understand that it's handier than just stabbing someone with. Yes. <laughs> very, very handy. Yeah. The things stylus that stylus or pointing or poking something or getting a splinter out or, you know, it's super the, handy. It's the super things handy that knife. make that an outstanding penetrator and stabber also make it an outstandingly handy implement all around. Something yeah. my grandma Tinarelli could have carried in her purse <laughs> and been just fine with. All right, I, I got one last question for you. And 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 uh, now that uh, on the heels of your last answer, I'm gonna I'm gonna slightly change it. And I I usually ask someone of your experience uh, what you would tell someone coming up, advice wise, how they can, um, you know, what they could do to uh, further themselves, get you know, push themselves a little bit further. But uh, I'm not asking you in terms of business wise. What's the best thing they can do, or what? I'm asking you psychologically. Um, what what can bladesmiths coming up, blade knife makers coming up, uh, do to enhance their thinking and push themselves further in their art, design, craft? Um, I say focus more on the the why instead of the what and how. So focus on why you want to make that thing. Why does that work? Why is it better? Why, why is it important? Why, you know, all the why questions you can ask about, you know, a hunting knife. Why, why, why a gut hook? Why not a gut hook? Why not this? Why not that? You know, or why do do it? And I think that will give them a, a more direct route to where they really want to go. Cause I watch people making stuff because they believe they should make it because someone else said do it, but it ain't what they want to make at all. Or especially on that business. Owner, absolutely. Positively do not make knives because you think I can make knives and make a couple extra bucks on the side. <laughs> That's not possible. You can't do it. It's just, it's not going to happen. And I've been doing this for a long time. It's just, it's, this is not, um, this is a lifestyle. This is a way of living, a way of doing, a way of sharing your thoughts and, and experiences and feelings with the rest of the world it just happens to be with knives. I'm sharing this with people with knives. Uh, it makes me a living because I figured out how to do it, but it's, it is not necessarily make any kind of a business or any kind of, you know, capital venture. This is because I love it because I want to share it because I want to change people's minds. I want to see people become a maker of something or, or make a difference in someone's life or make a difference in their own life. So that's the most important part to me. And that's the advice that I really give people directly. Make a difference. Ask a lot of why questions. Go directly to the place you want to go. Don't, you know, don't take all these side roads. Take the arrows path, you know, so. Hope that well, makes sense. That makes sense. There you heard it. Jason Knight, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate uh, your, your time and coming on and talking to you. And uh, I've admired your work from afar for so long, so it was nice to meet you in person, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.
Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Well, it was great to finally meet Jason Knight uh, in person, virtually. Uh, I've been, you know, a fan of his for a couple of years now, and uh, man, what a what a cool dude! I look forward to talking to him more, and I look forward to, uh, well, getting getting that MK Ultra folder in hand, and then maybe for an anniversary uh, in the in the in the next year or two, uh, going to his studio with my wife and learning the fine art and craft of knife making with Jason Knight. Uh, he, he says, ask the why questions. And to me, uh, yes, for knife makers, ask the why questions. And for everyone else, ask the why questions in everything. And then, and then after a while, you have to silence them so you can act. But um, that, and then also the fact that uh, I've never had anyone on this show say that perhaps bronze is superior to steel. And how cool to hear uh, as a as a geek of the bronze bronze age uh, epics and uh, yeah so that was cool to hear anyway it was such a pleasure to have Jason Knight on the show uh, if you enjoyed this interview and you like what we do here please uh, check us out on Patreon perhaps if you have the extra scratch you can help us uh, keep these shows coming uh, so for Jim working his magic behind the switcher and Jason Knight. Uh, Master Blades with uh, Smith, who was a pleasure to speak with. I am Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco saying uh, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.